would do penance. He would crawl on his bare knees up the steps of a cathedral to pay and atone for his own sins. He would confess every, he would try to remember every sin he'd ever commit, and he would confess it and go back in his memory and confess, and then he would fall asleep exhausted only to wake up knowing that he had forgotten something and he was not totally forgiven. What a horrible way to live. And then he read Galatians and he read Romans where it says the just shall live by faith. And he began to figure out the just shall live by faith in what? Faith in Christ. Faith in Jesus. 1 Corinthians 15, 3. I delivered to you as of first importance that Christ died for our sins, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day according to the scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, that he appeared to James, that he appeared to the apostles, that he appeared to over 500 at one time. You see, the whole message of the gospel is that Jesus came. He who knew no sin became sin. He took my sin, your sin, he took it on him. The wrath of God that was justifiable to punish us for sin was not placed on us, it was placed on Jesus, and he died as our substitute in our place, and he paid it all. All to him I owe. Sin had left the crimson stain, he washed it white as snow. Now that's the gospel. That's the gospel. 1 John 1, 9 says, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from most unrighteousness. Do you know that verse? That's not what it says. It doesn't say for most unrighteousness, it says all. And you know what's interesting about that verse? It's written to Christians. The previous verse says, if you as a Christian say that you have no sin, you're a liar. And you know what it says right after that verse in 9? You know what it says in 10? If you say you have no sin as a Christian, you're a liar. Because we still have sin in us. But you see, here's the great thing about Jesus. when Because we, we get dirty, don't we? If I confess my known sin, Jesus is such a great shepherd and Jesus is such a great savior that he not only forgives me for what I confess, he, can, he, he forgives me for what I don't even know that I did. If we confess our sins, he's faithful and just to forgive us of our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. There are sins of commission that I commit. There are sins of omission, things that I should do that I omit. I'm not even aware. We all have blind spots. I don't even know how much sin I commit, but he knows, and he's paid it all. That's the gospel. It's the greatest news in the world. Is it not? What a savior. What a shepherd. My gosh. Whom the son has set free is free indeed. When Jesus died on the cross for you and for your sin, here's a question for you. How many of your sins were future? It's not a trick question. Well, he died 2,000 years ago. You didn't exist 2,000 years ago. So all your sins that he paid for were in the future. So what does that mean as we're here today? It means this. As I stand here today, my sins of my past, Jesus paid for on the cross. It means the sins that I will commit today, Jesus paid for on the cross. Now, here's where you're going to get nervous. Some of you aren't going to like this but it's the gospel. The sins which I will commit in the future, Jesus already paid for. And you say, oh no, don't preach that. Well, why not? Well, people will just go live like hell. I don't think so. Romans says, shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? No. When you understand the grace and the goodness of what Jesus did, you're not going to go out and live crazy. You're going to live in thankfulness to him. He paid it all. That's the gospel. You see? It's the greatest news in the world. Why would you not want Jesus to be your shepherd? Everybody has a shepherd. Everybody. You see, for some people, their shepherd is money. For some people, their shepherd is power. For some, their shepherd is popularity. When we're young, we want to be popular. We want to be in with the in crowd. We want in middle school, high school, everybody to like us. Why would you want everybody to like you? Who cares? Well, I want everybody to sign my yearbook. Who cares? You're going to lose the yearbook anyway. You see? But when we're young, that's a big deal. But you've got to get over popular. I told my kids, I don't care if you're popular. I want you to be respected. You see? 
I want your character to be the kind of character. Broad is the road that leads to destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to life. Uh, parents, we're trying to work with our kids to help them avoid peer pressure because there's a lot of pressure in high school because most kids are going the wrong way down the wrong road. But peer pressure doesn't end in high school. It doesn't end in college. Peer pressure doesn't end in your 20s or 30s or 40s. I don't care how old you are, most of your peers are on the wrong path, go in the wrong direction, headed for destruction. Narrow is the gate that leads to life, and few are those who find it. You see, to follow Jesus, you never, when you're following Jesus, you're never going downstream, you're going upstream. You're going against the flow and against the current, and you're not going to be liked, and that's okay. All you want is at the end of your life is to hear, well done, thou good and faithful servant. So sheep are stupid, sheep are dirty. What's the third one? I have no clue. I just blanked. What is it? How would you know? You haven't heard this sermon yet. <laughs> sheep are dirty, they're stupid, and they're defenseless. Defenseless. This blue, I had never thought of this. Stop and think about this. Every animal that I can think of that God has created has some kind of defensive mechanism to help them fight off predators. You ever watch the National Geographic shows, you know, the little frogs can change colors, you know, chameleons or whatever they call those things, the little lizards. Uh, you know, you got the skunk and he, you know, everybody's got some kind of defensive, not sheep, not sheep. There have been known instances of ravens or crows swooping down on the head of a sheep and plucking out their eyeballs. That's horrible to think about. But what's the sheep going to do? Bark? <laughs> what's he going to do? Claw the bird to death? He has no claws. Why? God made the sheep defenseless. And over 200 times, he calls us sheep. See, we want to be in control. We want to defend ourselves. We want, and, and that's fine. We want to take care of our families and protect our families. That's why if I hear a noise at 3 in the morning, I say, Mary, go check that out. <laughs> Now, that's not Mary's job. That's a man's job. A man takes care of his family. A man protects his family. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her. Men get hurt for their wives. Men get hurt for their families. Men take the blows for their families. To be a husband, have you ever, ever, ever heard of animal husbandry? You can major in animal husbandry. If you go to an agricultural college, you know what animal husbandry is? It's the care of animals. It's the breeding and care of animals. What's a husband supposed to do? What's, you ever heard of land husbandry? What is, what, what is husbandry? Uh, land husbandry or land management is the care of the land. You do crop rotation. You, you work with your different crops and you take care and you till the land and it's taking care of the land. So what's a husband? It's someone who takes care. A husband is not someone who takes. A, a husband is not, one, is not one who takes advantage. A husband is one who does not take off. A husband takes care. Husbands, love your wives just as Christ loved the church. My job is to protect. My job is to provide. I had no intention of going there. That's for someone. If you leave, God can't fix it. So don't you leave. You stay at your post that Jesus has assigned you, and you be a man or woman of God. Your children need you to stay together. The fact of the matter is, folks, talking about family, can you be with your kids 24-7 to protect them? No. Can you be with your grandkids 24-7? No. Well, then you better have a shepherd who can be with them 24-7. The Lord is the defense of my life. Whom shall I fear? Jesus does not want us living in fear. Did you know that? Why does it say 200 times in the Bible, fear not? Because there's always something to be afraid of. And why, why does he say, fear not? Uh, is it Isaiah 41? Fear not, for I am with you. Do not anxiously look about you what's going to happen next. I am your God. I will uphold you with my mighty right hand. All the promises of God. Don't be afraid. Why? The Lord is my shepherd. Are you still with me? I'm not even out of verse 1 yet. 
There's a lot in here. The Lord is my shepherd, I shall not want. See, everybody has a shepherd. In John 10, 27, Jesus said this. And this is really important that we understand this. See, I live in Texas now, and Texas is very different from Hawaii. I don't know if you knew that. It's very different in a lot of ways. And Texas is very different from California, where I was raised. I understand that not a lot of the population in Hawaii goes to church. Uh, not a lot of people in California go to church. But in Texas, a lot of people go to church because it's the Bible Belt. In the South, people go to church. It's what you do. It's expected. In the South, you have a football game, they pray before the football game. I'm serious. It doesn't matter. I mean, they just do it. Uh, in the South, you go to a rodeo, they pray before the rodeo. If I was going to get on a bull, I would pray too. <laughs> but everybody prays, the cowboys take off their hat. I mean, it's just what they do. It's part of the culture. And there's the danger. You see, uh, everybody is steeped in Christianity. Everybody's been vaccinated with Christianity. And a lot of people go to church. An average-sized church in Dallas, where we live, an average-sized church will seat 3,000, 3,500 They'll have multiple services. Large churches seat 8, 10, 12,000, have multiple services. Everybody goes to church. When we moved to Texas, the second or third Sunday, we went to dinner, we went to lunch afterwards to a barbecue place, and it's a chain. And as I walked in, they had a sign. Uh, if you have a church bulletin, show it to the cashier for a 10% discount. They give you a discount for going to church. Hey, there are places in California, you go to church, they'll arrest you. I just made that up. But it's going that way, isn't it? Now, here's the danger, see? And a lot of people go to church, and they think the Lord is their shepherd because their grandpa was a preacher. And they know all the verses to all the hymns, and they can even quote verses, and it's just what they do. And... and how do you know if the Lord is your shepherd? In John 10, 27, Jesus said this. He said, my sheep hear my voice, and they follow me, and I give eternal life to them, and they shall never perish. No one can snatch them out of my Father's hand. It's very interesting. Back in the times of Jesus and in the Old Testament times, there's not a lot of water in Israel. So oftentimes at a well, when a shepherd shows up with his flock, there are other shepherds already there, watering their flocks from the same well. Then the sheep intermingle. When it's time to leave, how does the shepherd call out his sheep and not get other sheep and they don't get them mixed up? Because they have no way of identifying them. They don't brand them. They don't ear tag them. How does he do it? Here's what he does. When the shepherd is ready to leave, he simply calls to his sheep. And what happens is all the sheep hear him, but here's the difference. His sheep hear his voice, and his sheep follow his voice. My sheep hear my voice, and they what? Follow. They follow me. So who are you following? Who are you following? See? And this is eternal life, John 17, Jesus said, that they may know thee the only true God in Jesus Christ, whom thou hast sent. Jeremiah 9, let not the wise man boast of his wisdom. Let not the mighty man boast of his might. Let not the rich man boast of his riches, but let him who boasts boast of this, that he knows and understands me. There is a difference between knowing about Jesus and knowing Jesus. And when you know Jesus, you hear him and you follow him. That's how you know if the Lord is your shepherd. So who are you following? That's the issue.